Thank you very much. We were, um, before we began this event, we were bringing back to memory that I had the great honor and privilege of being here way back in 1993, precisely at uh, an event at the Pat Finucane Center. And it is for me many years later, and now having been a UN rapporteur, a great honor again to share with the Finucane family, with everyone the Pat Finucane Center, and all the organizations that have made this possible, and everyone who's here tonight, to share a little bit of our experiences over those years. When I came in 93, I was coming just as a lawyer from Guatemala, trying to seek truth and justice for a horrendous conflict that we had lived through of 36 years, that went through a period of genocide, a genocide that cost the lives of 200,000 people and 45,000 disappeared. And it is interesting that as usual, justice in my own country was also very slow. And it was not till 2003 that we were able, in a case that Paul and I and many of the victims especially had worked on in Guatemala, to bring this case to oral trial. And it was very, very significant because the cases that were, bring, were being brought to trial were the cases related to genocide in one ethnic region, the Ishil region of Mayan indigenous population. And there were cases back from 1982 and 83 when General Rios Montt, the dictator, was the head of state. And imagine it took from 1982 to 83 for us to be able to present the case in the year 2000. And after profiling the case in the year 2000, it was not until 2013, 13 years later, that the case came to oral trial. So it means that the victims waited from 82, 83 to 2013. And it's incredible, it's part of the resilience of the Mayan people who see time as well in generational terms. And it was interesting because it was a very important element to have access to justice at the, at, at the public level and with the protocol, and they had given them the main chamber in, in the court uh, system to have the meeting. But also, for the first time, they were being able to transmit live all the hearings that lasted about a month and a half. So the victims who had given their testimonies many times, because there had been books written on this, there had been investigations and research, but for the first time were able to give it to the justice system. And this was heard by everyone live. And it was a very, very powerful statement. In this court, this was criminal court, of a first degree court, has three judges in, in the system of Guatemala. After listening to all the testimonies and to the defense, and after a month and a half, it came to the conclusion that genocide had occurred. And there was actually a sentencing on General Rios Montt and his head of intelligence condemning them for the acts of genocide that had occurred in the country in two years, only two years they had been in power, 82 and 83. But interestingly enough, the shock of truth was so intense that the defense appealed the procedure to the constitutional court by saying that there had been violations to the procedure, not on substance, violations to the procedure which were really not true. But by then, the constitutional court was being dominated by the extreme right and the economic elite of the country, and we knew later that there had been elements of corruption with the court. And a week later, the Constitutional Court reversed that decision. It didn't declare him innocent. It just said that the trial had been annulled from sort of the middle of the hearings onward, and that it had to be repeated. So for these victims that had been waiting from 82, 83 to 2013, it was to wait again for a new trial to begin. That oral hearing has still not begun yet. 
uh, and may be set this year sometime. But the importance of this case, as difficult as justice may be and as tragic as a story like this may be, the importance of these hearings and of this trial was victims were able to tell their truth. And the truth of the victims is the real truth of society. And I think this is an important element to keep in mind. I had also the privilege of being the UN Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression from 2008 to 2014, for six years, the two periods that one is allowed. And one of my determinations, among many other topics, was to talk about the right to truth as the right of victims to access information. Freedom of expression has a double aspect to it, has the right to access information freely, especially public information, and then to disseminate and impart information, ideas, and opinion. But normally when we talk about accessing information, we're talking about transparency and accountability of public officials, which is very important in any democratic society. Yes, combating corruption or making them accountable to their decisions. But my feeling was that in the UN system and in the area of freedom, we had not insisted in another form of accountability, which is releasing information, all information, to the victims of human rights violations. And the logic is very simple. If the state has the responsibility to protect and promote the respect for human rights of all people in their jurisdiction, it also has the obligation to investigate when these rights are being violated. And if there is an investigation, then it should have the obligation to report and to inform the victims. And obviously it has an investigation to develop a criminal investigation and to punish those responsible. That is very simple. That is normally in our constitutional systems. But we emphasize very little on the right of the victims of having access to that information and having access to the justice system. Demanding justice should not be a privilege, should be a normal reality in all our countries, in all democratic states. In the UN, there was a development of the principles on impunity. And it was, they were later updated by, by a professor friend of mine, Diane Orlinger. And it was interesting because the principles on impunity is how to struggle to strengthen justice and eradicate the lack of justice or the malicious delay of justice. But she has in principle four, if I recall correctly, one interesting item that I related in my report. She said, just establishing the truth of what happened of violations is the first step to eradicate uh, uh, impunity, even if it doesn't go to trial. And then the Inter-American Court had a case, the massacre El Mosote, where in El Salvador, where it actually reaffirmed this by saying there could be no prosecution in this case, and therefore the state refused to release the information because they said if there can be no prosecution, we have no obligation to release the information of how this massacre occurred. And the court said, no, these are two different things. Yes, there is an obligation to prosecute those responsible for atrocities, human rights violations, and especially crimes against humanity. But beyond that, there is another obligation, which is to inform the victims, and in this case, to inform a community of what happened. Because it is part of their history. It is part of the knowledge that they should have. Not only this generation, but future generations. So we guarantee the principle of non-repetition. So these events will not repeat themselves, will not happen again. So I quoted that. Impunity begins to get confronted and the wall of impunity gets torn down initially by the truth. The truth became something so important that we recognized it as a right. And I say in my report, this is not a philosophical question, it's, it's, it's a legal question, because the right to truth is not that we all, anyone particularly possesses the truth. The truth is a process. We're all searching for the truth. But in searching for the truth constantly, we have the right to access information systematically. And it is this search for finding the reality of events that the state has an obligation to cooperate. 
And what I mentioned in my report is the right to choose initially in Latin America, where the term began, was be initially used, began with the families that disappeared because they wanted to set the truth, find out what happened to their loved ones that had vanished, that had been disappeared by security forces or by agents of the state. But then it was expanded to the families and to relatives of other violations, of summary executions, or people who were survivors of torture, or people who had suffered persecution or illegal imprisonment, arbitrary detention. So the right to truth began to expand to all victims and all violations. But in a way, I said, the right to truth is also an element of historical memory of a society. In our society in Guatemala, where we went through a period of genocide, this is relevant not only for those that were victims of the acts of genocide, but for our society as a whole. So the period of genocide is the most traumatic period in, in any society. So the fact that we should know what happened, who made the decisions, why the decisions were made, and how it impacted our society is a national necessity, is a, a historical existential necessity of our people. So it turns out that the right to truth is the right of victims, yes. It's the right of relatives of victims. It's the right of friends and the community around the victims, like in the case of El Mosote. But in a way, it's the right of society to register your own history. And in my report, I ended up saying, only the people of a nation that are allowed to fully assimilate their past and understand their past will really be free to determine their future. If someone is denying our past, if we don't have the facts and the issues clear, especially on human rights violations, then we won't be able to determine the future. And finally, we moved into the question of what are the limitations? Because obviously, in, uh, when you talk about the laws of access to information, well, there's some information that may be sensitive to the state. National security, well, under national security, in my country, Guatemala, again, which I can use easily as an example, uh, the Ministry of Defense used to say that the budget of the Ministry of Defense is a very sensitive matter. So they could not release the facts of the budget or how they use the budget. This is false. All democratic societies make, make this public. What they were hiding was the corruption in the, in, the, in the way they were handling the budget. So we discovered that the budget really does not mean national security, even if it is of the Ministry of Defense. So they were saying, well, the promotions, the promotions of the, of the um, uh, officers to higher ranks <coughs> is, is a matter of security because you cannot identify it. It turns out that the promotions were being published in the newspapers. All you had to go back is look in the, in the archives of the National Library and we would find the names. So many things that were being called national security really were not. So I say, at the end, national security is really security operations in the moment they're happening, international relations, especially international negotiations, and matters of international uh, dimension that can alter the, the relationship of the state uh, on, on international affairs, uh, the security of, of, of the higher level officials of government, if it compromises that, their, 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 their daily routine. Their, but everything else in state should be public. And especially everything related to human rights violations. And I began to discover there are several legislations, uh, if I recall correctly, Argentina and Uruguay, for instance, in their access to information law, specifically have a clause that says not even national security can be used as an excuse to limit the access of victims to the information of who committed the violations and why. Because always it's a very easy excuse to say in the defense of national security we won't tell you what was done, who did it, and why. And then the victims should continue being re-victimized now by the silence of the state. This is impossible. And the, the, the worst thing, what people don't recognize, is this perpetuates a state of tolerance with violations or a state that covers and, and has complicity with violations. So yes, national security is a concern. I'm not denying it, and I said it. And yes, in the world of today, a dangerous world, we do have a concern with national security. 
But national security has to be very clearly and finely defined in those issues that really put the state at risk <laughs> in terms of its own operations or the security of heads of state or of some degree of security operations as they are happening. Otherwise, they just become a global term that anyone can use. And this is a crucial element that was established in, in this document. And very specifically, I was interested in mentioning also that when we talk about the right of society to recuperate the memory, we're also talking about keeping our relatives alive. Because I ended my report by saying, no one really passes away, no one really dies, as long as there are people that remember them, as long as people keep their memory alive. And it is in their memory and the memories we have of all of them in, in our daily life, in our daily memorialization, in our daily struggles for justice, that all our relatives, our friends, and our society are still alive from our generation or past generations. And we keep on remembering. And this is a wealth, historical wealth of society, that no one can deny us, the reconstruction of our history and of our martyrs and of our heroes that we want to build. This is the important element. Let me finish by saying that coming back to, to Belfast, since 1993 till today in, in 2016, I'm very pleased to see the development of what became of what was an incipient peace process and what is the development. But I think that today uh, the, the North of Ireland is going through a very special historical moment. And it is a moment of, of reconciliation, and it is a moment of dealing with elements of truth and defining what went wrong in the past, because we have to exercise the principle of non-repetition. We always have to overcome the past, but we never overcome the past by ignoring it. That happens to us as individuals, but it also happens to us as societies. We can only overcome the past and build from the past if we assimilate it completely. And sometimes it's painful, but it is a very liberating pain. And I think this is the moment when in the new sort of developments being established and the possibility of creating the HIU and, and, and all the, the initiatives that are being discussed today in Belfast, I think this is a very important historical moment precisely to establish the truth of the past for everyone, no matter who it is, from what corner of, 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 of the region, from what county, or, or from what background, what family. It is the truth of everyone and for everyone. But it is important that the truth be established. And like I said, the truth for me is not a result, is not something that we grab. The truth in a way is always a process. It's something we keep on building, we keep on, on completing, we keep on restructuring as we find more and more information. We keep on strengthening it and, and drawing new conclusions, which makes us stronger for the future. So I would just like to end having expressed my best desires for the future of this wonderful part of Ireland where I think that this is a historical moment of decision that can be based on truth, justice, and reconciliation if there is the desire to clarify all the events and it is the desire to establish every fact and everything that went wrong to make sure that it never happens again. Thank you. In a sense, the greatest achievement of our species as a collective achievement is actually the rule of law. It's the thing that allows societies to work together and to find a way of peacefully resolving disputes. That's the point of it. That's what it does. And that's what it's done effectively uh, for hundreds of years in uh, a, an ever-growing number of countries. And my organisation is called the International Centre for Transitional Justice, and essentially that's what we do. We work in countries where the rule of law has been fundamentally undermined or ripped apart, or where there's been enormous violations of human rights, 
or where, for whatever reason, the basic trust in the social contract has been uh, torn up. And we work in trying to find ways in which you can start to put that trust in the rule of law back together again. And it might seem a far-fetched thing to say, but I genuinely believe that. I've got friends who criticise me for being a very conservative Western lawyer that's got a fetish about the rule of law. But I honestly believe that it is the best thing that we've come up with uh, for solving the problems that we have. Everyone knows the limitations. Everyone knows that ultimately the institutions of the rule of law are populated by human beings with all of their frailties, with all of their uh, proclivities and their temptations, and we all know what that can lead to. But it's the best we've got. And ultimately, when we talk about what my organisation calls transitional justice and dealing with all of these things that have occurred and trying to find a way to solve it, it's about trying to restore trust in the rule of law. And what is the essence of that rule of law? I think it's fundamentally about basically one thing. It's about taking seriously the dignity of individuals. It's about taking seriously the fact that each person that deserves and uh, merits simply by the fact of being a citizen or being a human being, the protection of that rule of law, that is the dignity that they deserve and which they require if the rule of law is to work. And all of the work that we're talking about and the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of justice, that's what we're talking about. It's about restoring trust in the basic idea of the dignity of each and every person, of the victims who have been killed, who have been murdered, who have been disappeared, of the people who have been left behind as the um, survivors and the people who are somewhat burdened by the task of carrying on the memory and the pursuit of justice. Um, that's not a job that anyone would wish on uh, their, their friends or perhaps even their enemies. It's a hell of a burden to put on people and families. And it's a thing that um, I think very often in many of the countries that we've worked in, it's a thing that is very hard to get through to people who are reluctant to provide the information, <coughs> reluctant to open the pathways of justice, to realise just what an enormous additional psychological burden they are putting on people who have already suffered so much. It's hard to think of a way in which you could deny the dignity of those people much more than through that kind of denial. So I think there is a fundamental line for me that runs through this about the rule of law and the pursuit of dignity and taking that dignity seriously. If we don't have that, the rest of it really isn't worth very much. So I think that when I think of someone like Pat Finucane and the fact that he was a lawyer working to defend the rights of uh, individuals in very, very complicated circumstances that leaves one open to all sorts of allegations, however spurious, um, is a, a, a task of enormous bravery in the first place. Uh, to lose one's life in doing it, if one takes so seriously the rule of law, uh, I can think of very few more noble causes, if you like, uh, in which to lose one's life. But I think it's so important in those circumstances to take seriously the rights of the family that have survived Pat uh, and to take seriously that opportunity to say, well, what does the rule of law mean? Here we are talking about lawyers defending people being murdered. There's, there's not really much of an easier way to undermine the idea of the rule of law. So I do want to pay respect to that sacrifice and that death and the family and the work that they have done and all of the organisations that have worked around that. As I say, it's hard to think of anything more crucial than taking seriously the right to justice in the case of a lawyer who has been murdered in the pursuit of the rule of law. In the context of the current debate, uh, we've been talking a lot about the mechanisms that are being suggested um, in the, I think it's the Fresh Start Agreement. One comes into a, a country and is uh, flooded with papers and tries to remember acronyms and different phases, but I think that's the last iteration of this um, process. And the Mechanisms that are suggested, I think a lot of people see as being very fruitful uh, progress and perhaps some people have said that the best deal that's been uh, suggested so far and that's an enormously encouraging state to be at. 
but the questions that Frank raised and that are uh, in many people's minds is this question of what's the relationship, what's the legitimate relationship, if you like, between concerns about national security, uh, concerns about the protection of the right to life, um, the threats that would arise from the disclosure of information. So one of the things that I've been doing is looking at past experiences. My organisation is immodestly thinks itself a leading organisation in relation to countries' experiences uh, of dealing with these things. And what's curious, if you look at the past examples of a huge range of countries, many of them that we have worked in, um, if not all of them, from Argentina to Chile to Liberia to Peru to Guatemala, South Africa, there has never really been a suggestion of including a national security prohibition uh, in in the question of disclosure of information. No Truth Commission's mandate has ever included that, for example. So this would be a rather unique situation. That's not to say that there have been situations where governments or state institutions have not disclosed information. If we talk about Guatemala's situation, the Guatemalan Truth Commission didn't have the power to compel testimony or witnesses. It was very much a seen as a weak mandate at the time when it was uh, put together in, in the, in the mid-1990s. Uh, the Truth Commission didn't start operating. The mandate was put together before the end of the war and the Commission started operating two years after the end of the war. So there was a, a, a significant period of time uh, in between. And the mandate was broadly regarded as weak and the army, frankly, could not be compelled to cooperate and chose not to cooperate. So the pursuit of documents and information was very difficult. One did get information through different sources and various uh, parts of uh, military archives did make their way to um, the Truth Commission, but not through official channels. So one doesn't pretend that the fact that there isn't a prohibition on national security, uh, that doesn't mean that some governments and some military, for example, don't cooperate. There's many examples where they don't cooperate. That's not really the point, but the point is that it would be the first time, in my knowledge, that there had been an explicit mechanism that um, uh, addressed the question of national security uh, as a balance for the release of information. And I think that's an interesting and, and potentially worrisome approach to the concept of the right to truth. One of the things that we've been talking about is, in a sense, there's, there's two ways of starting to look at this, this question. What's your point of departure? You can start from a national security point of view, or you can start from a human rights point of view. And uh, when you're talking about egregious violations and serious crimes, I think in this day and age, um, it's hard to uh, support any approach other than starting from the human rights point of view. The issue is how do you get the information out there? And starting from a human rights point of view, of course, embraces the idea. And no one in this room, as far as I would guess, and no one in any of the conversations we have had, would begin to suggest that it would be appropriate to threaten the life of another person through the disclosure of information. It's an absolutely, it's not legitimate, it's an obligation of the state to protect the life of its citizens and to take all proper due diligence measures to ensure that they are not putting citizens in harm's way through any measures that they take or that others might take, that's pretty much an obvious statement at this stage. But there is, as Frank was kind of suggesting, I think, a significant difference between a human rights approach that includes not only the right to truth, but the right to protect or the duty to protect the life of potential uh, persons that might be threatened by the release of information. That is not necessarily a straightforward idea to be conflated with national security. Frank was saying there is a need to define national security and it's not that common an idea, I would say it's a very uncommon idea to suggest that the threat to an individual as a person who may be implicated or a person who may be involved in a crime, to suggest that that's a na natural national security consideration is relatively unusual if not quite unique. The trouble with saying that is that getting a definition of national security, as many of you know, is um, really uh, very hard to come by. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, security apparatuses don't want to define national security because it ties their hands and it doesn't suit the necessity of the day when they're trying to address unforeseen threats, etc. That's 
the benign explanation of why there's no uh, very coherent definition of national security. But the idea that the threat to an individual who perhaps operated 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago can constitute a live threat to the national safety, uh, the safety of the nation or the integrity of its international relations today is one that takes some uh, explanation and justification. And I think there is a very live need for us to pass out what's the difference between taking seriously the right to life of potential uh, of people who may be potentially threatened and the genuine nature of national security. I am seen, as I've already kind of indicated by some people, as a fairly conservative lawyer uh, when it comes to some of these things. And I have got enormous sympathy uh, for the genuine uh, considerations of national security. But as I say, we have to be careful about defining what those are. And this would be a very unusual circumstance to describe it in these terms. The question of what other countries have done and the experiences, as I say, no Truth Commission, to the extent that Truth Commissions are relevant, uh, has done this as far as I'm aware. And having looked at the mandates recently, I don't see any example of it. Some Truth Commissions, we published a manual, I think, in 2013, where we explicitly say the idea of national security should not be applied in mandates of Truth Commissions uh, when the issue of trying to get information out uh, is at play. It's, um, that's, that's a standard position. It's a standard position that Frank has enunciated. It's the position that I think uh, is pretty much the mainstream human rights position. If there's no experience of it, under what circumstances could it be justified? I think, A, if we can get a clear definition of national security and perhaps an, agree to separate it out from the right to life issue in general, that would be a step forward. The second issue that many of you are debating is the mechanism by which one could reasonably um, ensure this question of what information should be released, etc. I don't think it's our role here in this audience tonight to um, talk about what the specifics of those kinds of uh, measures should be. But I think I want to go back to an earlier point. What we're trying to do in all of this, in the restoration of confidence in the rule of law, means restoring confidence in the institutions themselves. And that means sometimes accepting that there isn't quite the confidence in them at the moment that we would like there to be in the future. And that may mean accepting that there is a need for an ad hoc or expedited process that isn't just following the, 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 the traditional justice system. It may mean suggesting a mechanism within the disclosure process that allows for an ad hoc expedited process with measures of impartiality and independence guaranteed, whether that's through international presence or uh, uh, other kind of characters involved. But there has to be an acceptance that there is, at this stage in a society's transition towards the respect for the rule of law, a need to fill the deficit in confidence. And that might mean the need to find a mechanism that is not the standard application of the, the court system as it stands. I don't want to go into much more detail than that, other than to say almost every country that we have worked in has had to find a mechanism that is not the normal justice system for the very same reasons. And in that sense, Northern Ireland is not unique. The deficit in confidence in institutions is the norm after violations of human rights have occurred. That's what happens. People lose confidence. There's no mystery in that. And it's very often the case that all of those countries will establish either a truth commission or they will invite in international judges to sit in trials in their countries or they will create hybrid courts or they will uh, create co commissions of inquiry with international components that will find a way to earn the confidence of the population at large. I think at the heart of all of this is that we're looking for measures that restore confidence first and foremost in the people who have suffered the people who have suffered most have lost the most confidence for obvious reasons. The purpose is not to protect vested, in, uh, vested interests of institutions who have something to hide. That's not the purpose of the process. It's not the purpose of the process in any country that is trying to grapple with the violence of the past. Of course, there are always enormously strong institutions that are fighting like hell against the release of information. That's par for the course. 
No one wants to give away the store if it's going to be enormously embarrassing or enormously damaging to their integrity of what they think has happened in the past. But that's the case. That's what happens when there's been massive violations of human rights and serious violations. The only way to regain that trust is to find a way to say there has to be an impartial analysis that allows us to find the truth and for that to be released. As Frank says, this is an issue that is crucial not just for victims but for society as a whole. And I think the whole issue of what it is we're trying to get to in the pursuit of that information um, is the restoration of confidence not only in institutions, but yes, crucially, in institutions. That's how the rule of law works in developed democracies. We have to trust our police services. We have to trust our judicial services. We have to trust those who are engaged in guaranteeing our fundamental human rights. That's the business that we're talking about here. So steps will have to be taken to guarantee that. And the balance cannot be in the protection of vested interests, legitimately or understandable as they are. We're all human beings. No one wants to be fundamentally embarrassed. No one wants to have their uh, past uh, misdemeanours uh, put out in the public domain. We understand that, but that is sometimes what's necessary. And it's not the, it's not the balance to protect people from embarrassment. But what it's about the protection of the reputation or the protection from embarrassment or the reversal of a long-held narrative. All of those things have to go. The right to truth requires the balance very much in favour of disclosing that information, however embarrassing, however damaging to previous accounts, however damaging to individuals in high standing. That's just par for the course. That what, that's what the right to truth means. And if we're going to restore confidence, I think some kind of criteria in what are legitimate reasons for non-disclosure, that would be a helpful development in the, in the discussion. Frank was uh, mentioning the idea of memory and, and uh, keeping that alive, and I think a lot of people think of the idea of truth commissions uh, or transitional justice as very important in the concept of memory. And I think one of the some people who are better read than me will know the quote properly. I think is it uh, William Faulkner has a line. I think it's the past is, is not it's not yet dead. It isn't even past. I think that's the line. I think that's a quote. And I think, in particularly when one meets victims of human rights abuses and, and like the family that I was talking about tonight, the Fanukin family, the vividness of the violation, the the feeling of you know even on nights like this to some extent having to think about all of that again. Victims of serious human rights violations um, do not ever quite uh, have the luxury of moving on. Uh, they can move on with their lives and create uh, incredible uh, lives for themselves. I'm not saying that's not possible. But I often hear the line put by people who don't want to support the right for truth and the right for justice telling us you know, we have to just draw a line and move on. Well, that's a very uh, insensitive proposal, if I may say so, to the people who have suffered these things. They don't have that luxury. Um, what they require is the dignity uh, to be restored and recognised. Moving on uh, to the extent that it's possible requires dealing profoundly, sincerely and robustly with the past. One cannot pretend that one lives in a vacuum. One can't just start from year zero. We've seen countries that have tried that and we know what happened. This isn't a situation where you can deny the reality of memory and deny the reality of pain. And it's, I think, our experience in so many countries that the culture of denial is the thing that actually stops countries moving on. Frank was mentioning the situation in Guatemala and the the trial of Rios Montt that took place in the amazing scenes in the courtroom were the stuff of a Hollywood movie. One couldn't have scripted it in terms of its drama and its poignancy. But there was another side to it as well, which spoke to the enormous chasm that still exists in that country. And the fact that I think three days before the trial concluded, 
I don't remember the number, I think about 13 former senior politicians, including the former Vice President, the former Secretary for Peace, the former Senior Advisor to the Government in the Peace Negotiations, and various other people, uh, all seen as, in a sense, moderate uh, in a very relative context in Guatemala, um, signed a full-page letter in the paper saying that, and now this again goes to the issue of the rule of law, saying that it's crucial that a verdict is not returned in this case. Basically said it's time to stop the trial. This is about two days before the trial was due to conclude. These are people who have been standing for years talking about the success of Guatemala, being garlanded the world over for their successful peace process, saying that we have to stop this. And the logic of stopping it, and this was in text, it wasn't uh, uh, implicit or uh, uh, surmised. The logic of stopping it was it would be a fundamental disgrace on the reputation of Guatemala to have a conviction in the con uh, on genocide by a head of state. It would just be an enormous damage to our international reputation. And that's why I'm, I'm concerned about the concept of embarrassment and reputation vis-a-vis -vis the right to truth. The idea that established, respected politicians could think it's OK to go into print on a genocide case, genocide, and say the reason not to finish the trial is because we would be embarrassed. Not to say, let's see what the evidence takes us, and my God, if there was genocide in the country, let's face up to it and do something about it. Instead of that, they say, let's stop the trial now. This is going to be pretty humiliating. I think if you want a graphic description of both getting your priorities wrong, but also the chasm that still exists in that society... And I put it forward as an example to just finish on, on one or two other thoughts. We cannot expect too much of the truth either. And it goes back to ideas about the rule of law. The rule of law won't make us all love each other. The rule of law will allow us to stop killing each other. The rule of law will allow us to not be murdered. The rule of law will allow us to find the truth about those things when it happens. It won't make a perfect society. And when people talk about reconciliation and catharsis and all of that, I take it with a pinch of salt because there are enormous journeys to be travelled of a personal and social nature before that kind of thing can happen. Let's not put too many burdens on the idea of the right to truth and the right to justice. It can, t it can do some things for us, but we cannot change the hearts and minds of individuals uh, by these means alone. That's a much bigger social and political issue. So I think we have to be realistic about how much these things can deliver. But at the heart, the right to truth is a, an issue about restoring dignity. It's an issue about restoring um, the, the concept of trust in the rule of law. And unless we deliver that, and unless we find the right balance, and unless we exclude what ought to be spurious um, uh, possible exceptions to finding that truth, we're not going to make the progress that we have to. As I say, it's an enormous privilege to be here. I wish all of you all the best as you struggle with the very real challenges. I do hope that in the very near future you will have in place uh, the institutions and mechanisms that do allow you to <coughs> make serious headway on finding the truth and the justice that you, your families, your relatives and your society so badly need. Uh, it won't solve every problem in society but it will go a long way to restoring trust. Uh, so I wish you well in that. Again, I thank the family for the kind invitation to be here tonight. Uh, so thank you very much.